Welcome back, everyone. I hope those sessions um, were enlightening. I know I've heard a lot about the relaxation that was going on, um, being led by Panthea Lee in her section, in her session, and then um, saw a lot of uh, lively chat in the autonomous vehicle workshop. Um, we are now at our closing uh, fireside chat. And I'm really excited about this conversation as a way to wrap up a great two days. Um, please join me in welcoming to the virtual stage, Vishan Chakrabarti. Vishan brings over 25 years of experience authoring and implementing visionary design. He's the founder and creative director of PAU, Practice for Architecture and Urbanism, and serves as the William Worcester Dean of the College of the Environmental Design at the University of California, Berkeley. Vishan also has a stint in government. Um, he's done his, his tour of duty. He served under Mayor Michael Bloomberg as the director of the Manhattan office for the New York Department of City Planning. And in that role, he successfully collaborated on the now realized efforts to save the High Line, rezone Hudson Yards, rebuild the East River waterfront, and reincorporate the street grid at the World Trade Center site after the events of 9-11. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Um, and I think part of what is so exciting is I always see a bit of a disconnect between what I think of as like design and architecture and planning with a lot of the technology that really comes in, 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 my, in my fold and how these two worlds come together um, in a world that is rapidly modernizing is one of the things that I'm really, really curious about. And then on top of that, um, Vashon, you talk about the planet being at an inflection point. You talk about us needing to center around climate and injustice and making sure that the built environment represents a just world. It's hard to find folks that really are bringing all of these pieces together in a real like in, on these global platforms. So um, perhaps we could just start by listening and hearing more about your own background um, and how you came, you know, your love of our architecture and how you um, decided to start up PAU. Thanks, Lillian. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And um, I think I start, well, I was born in Calcutta and um, like right in the heart of the city. And then my parents emigrated to the United States and we I ended up being raised in this really boring kind of violent suburb outside of Boston. And we would go back to India when I was young and then my dad was a scientist my mom was a librarian and a musician and that set up the left brain right brain tug of war that has been me ever since and um, you know we would spend a lot of time on these kind of uh, shoestring trips to Europe and so forth and we'd go to cities and museums and I just fell in love not just with cities but like kind of the oxygen that makes up cities in terms of people in the places they inhabit, um, especially in terms of buildings and infrastructure. And so I think that set the stage for what I do now and done with all my life. And what do you think um, makes PAU and the work that you're doing unique as compared to what others are thinking about today? Well, you know, architecture is a hard field and um, about uh, five years ago, I turned 50 and I had worked at a lot of like really large corporate architecture firms and just in big places. And I thought, you know, I always wanted my own firm. And if there was ever going to be a moment to do it, it was going to be now. I wasn't going to do it when I was 75. So it was time to kind of step off the precipice. And and I did. And POW is now um, about 20 to 25 people. And we're doing exactly the work that we set out to do, which was to try to advance cities that were about ecology and equity and the projects that we're doing you know like we're, we just won this competition to expand the rock and roll hall of fame in cleveland and a lot of our work is actually in a lot of um deindustrialized cities or cities that suffered from deindustrialization so we've, i mean we've got active work in detroit downtown niagara falls newark indianapolis cleveland and so you th there's a through line there right about cities that I think time sort of forgot, but are are recovering and are, have a new kind of lease on life. And I think culture is a really big part of that. So something like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is a huge magnet. Uh, in Detroit, we're working for Ford uh, to re-establish uh, uh, Michigan Central Station as a real innovation hub for the city of Detroit. 
And it's that kind of work that I really wanted to do. I didn't want to go and do, you know, crazy spaceships built by slaves in the sand out uh, uh, somewhere else, but really focus on things that I think people need, uh, which is this investment and focus in our cities here and places that are in trouble. Yeah, no, and it definitely resonates. A lot of our um, audience and, and and night communities in themselves are really representative of, um, as Kelly Jin earlier this morning mentioned, the fabric of the U.S. And a lot of, as much as we have, you know, the uh, the Philadelphia's, the Miami's of the world, we also have a lot of deindustrialized communities um, that are, are that are trying to find their way through um, this next phase. Um, and you know, so kind of maybe digging into that. Um, we talk a lot in our work around how to create sort of vibrant public spaces because we think that they're critical to helping communities, um, you know, not just thrive, but also in many ways bring back a lot of individuals that have left these cities. How do you see your, I mean, what's the role of design in that? Um, you know, I'll just say in context for us, it's been a lot about thinking about the reuse of the public realm, you know, in, in a lot of cases, it's how do we bring, you know, you know, pop up parklets and, you know, bring more biking and infrastructure into these communities. How are you seeing that? And I'm also curious, like, and, and how do we do it in a way, your eye towards, like, how do we do it in a way that's actually really sustainable for communities that aren't like New York, that may not have the budgets and the real estate revenue mm -hmm. coming, tax revenue to sustain these ideas? Yeah, well, first of all, I couldn't agree with you more on the focus on public space. And I think public space is incredibly important for a couple of different reasons. Um, you know, Public space is still in, in this world in which feels increase, increasingly divisive because of social media and so forth. We need public space to create what I like to call positive social friction among people of difference, right? That I'm really worried that increasingly people with different points of view have no kind of platform where they're really engaging. And I think public space is really critical. So when you see that person who dresses differently or looks differently, they're not as scary as media makes them out to be. In fact, they're a great person to get to know. And, and I think public space plays this huge engine. It, it can be this big engine in terms of um, healing some of the social fraying that we have today. Uh, in a lot of cities, you're right, that don't have these big budgets and so forth, I think a lot of it's about upcycling. You know, one of the things that's happened through the course of the 20th century is cities lost a lot of density and a lot of urban fabric to the automobile. So there's a lot of, you know, uh, surface parking. And, you know, you take a city like Detroit, which has a fraction of the population of, say, a New York or a San Francisco, yet has enormous, enormous amounts of land dedicated to pavement. And so rather than say, well, let's reinvent the wheel, we can just think about, well, what can we do with that pavement? And how can we go and talk to communities about what else they'd like to see there? You know, it, it because so much of it isn't necessary for vehicular traffic and it's opportunities for farmers markets and street fairs and also like in some cases homeless services or there's just a lot of things that can happen with the upcycling of our existing infrastructure which I think is much more of a 21st century sustainability idea than the 20th century tabula rasa, just build a new thing from scratch. I wanna to get to this point of upcycling a bit more, but um, before you do, I'm curious on the public spaces point and this and this coming together of people of different lives in these, in these public spaces, I was curious about that. You've designed some amazing like buildings and I and I think about the Penn Station example. I've looked at some of the visualizations. I mean, there's nothing more there's nothing like I you know, in New York as an example where you know these spaces where people of all walks of life cross through them. And um I was talking with a colleague about this. I mean, there's and I am not an architect, yeah, I'm not a designer, but there, I think there's there's a potential here to sort of develop these as like sort of pass through places where people, you know, you just walk through and kind of, how do we design those spaces in a way that as all of those people are coming through to your point, they really, there is some deeper interaction. There's some deeper engagement. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, right there. you know, a lot of this, you know, it's interesting. It's a, it's a kind of back to the future question, 
Lillian, because, you know, I think traditionally, we, we had this era in the 1900s where, uh, especially where you saw train stations and other notions of public places be built with a sense of generosity as a place, you know, you think about, say, Grand Central Station or Detroit's mm -hmm. Michigan Central Station when it was a big thriving station, you know, and then we sort of lost that and and modernism became about efficiency and this idea of passing through because people were on their way to the suburbs and it was about this kind of the hustle and bustle of that Don Draper lifestyle. And I think we've come to understand that there's a kind of deep problem with that lifestyle uh, from a carbon footprint standpoint, but also again, this sort of social bubble kind of um, standpoint. And so we need to think about public spaces in a really expansive way. I mean, every building we design, even when we design a building for a private client, we're always in search of spaces that can be used for the public, especially in or around the ground floor, you know, where, you know, it's something that's easy to access, provide some shelter, you know, and just allows people to, again, engage with each other, to have that positive social friction. Um, and the problem, the problem I find, I mean, like, we still haven't gotten that Penn Station proposal built, like we proposed that with the New York Times back in 2016. And it's still a mess. And even a very, very wealthy city like New York has very substandard public infrastructure. So the stuff that everyday people use in a city like New York doesn't have anywhere near the kind of investment level that's put into it that say the luxury condos do or the very high-end parks that are in wealthy neighborhoods. And so, you know, we really do need to figure out how to focus more equ equitably in our rich and poor cities on these places that can help bring people together. And I think those one last thing I'd just like to say about this is I think especially in poorer neighborhoods that if you give people a sense that society cares about you, like they're willing to put investments into places that people have a different attitude towards those places, that they, that there's like less graffiti and there's less, you know, there's less vandalism because there's just this sense that there, that, that we have a collective as a society and that we care about people, whether they're rich or poor. And I think that there's been a real dearth of that sensibility and design is often a reflection of that societal impulse about whether we only design for the wealthy or really design for everybody. Yeah, no, I, and I think it's a constant struggle. And um, I have, you know, colleagues across the the night communities who really have been investing in public spaces, but are still grappling with this question of um, inclusivity and the community really feeling like they can own the space and be in the space, even if it's out there and in the in the realm. Um, so you talk a little bit about, um, or I've heard you talk about the infrastructure of opportunity. Um, I'd love for you to share, kind of, for folks, what it, what do you mean by that? Um, and we've heard a lot in the last two days about, you know, these references to infrastructure bills um, out there. And we now have a bill. Um, and I'd love to, one, hear about what infrastructure of opportunity looks like. And also, are we even meeting the mark? I mean, where, you know, what do our cities really still need to be digging into to get to a, a more inclusive public realm? You know, so that term infrastructure of opportunity I coined as part of, I wrote a book in 2013 about American cities and I, I'm actually really dead tired because I just, I'm just finishing up the manuscript for my next book and I'm still holding on near and dear to that concept. And the idea is a basic one. It's that infrastructure isn't just the traditional things that we think about like transport and water and sewage and electricity, but it's all the things that create social mobility, right? So we need to think of housing as infrastructure. We need to think of cultural institutions as infrastructure, uh, public spaces, uh, healthcare, educational spaces, because they're all the things that build social mobility in our society. And um, what I think was really fascinating to watch over these last few months on this infrastructure bill in Washington is I actually think the original Biden proposal got it. Like they, they were out there saying infrastructure is a much bigger thing, right? And unfortunately what you're seeing in the new Senate bill is the 1950s version of infrastructure. So there's a really great graphic that ran in the times yesterday that talked about the original proposal versus what seems to be the bipartisan compromise. And so I think the bipartisan compromise is largely saying, well, yeah, of course we need to fix all these decrepit roads and bridges and, you know, power grid systems and stuff. And that's good. It's good. It's a step forward. But 
missed all the stuff on buildings, missed all the stuff on clean energy, missed all the stuff on, on human infrastructure in terms of, you know, paying, helping to pay for childcare and other things that, you know, Democrats were arguing for as a sort of broader definition of helping to create social infrastructure. You know, the thing is, I think there's a lot of confusion when we talk about equity because like equity is a really hard concept. You know, yeah. people are not people are not born equal. People have different skills. To me, the most fundamental place to at least begin the conversation is to say equal opportunity, that a kid born in a rich place and a kid born in a poor place should have an equal chance regardless of where they were born. I mean, I like I I know some people will take the concept of equity further than that, and I respect that. I'm just saying, like, can we at least create that as a baseline condition? Uh, and that's what infrastructure is about. That larger sense of infrastructure opportunity is about creating equity of opportunity. No, I'm, I I like the I love the idea of the infrastructure of opportunity, and we we talk a lot about all of those things. Uh, it's amazing that it's still, um, I, you know, it's like still a hard sell um, at a national level to get um, our leadership to really think about these infrastructure components as critical to their own success, frankly, their own community success. Um, and I know that we have a lot of folks from night communities here who um, who are deeply in, invested in a lot of these efforts. So I invite them all to ask questions or share share thoughts in the in the chat. Um, I mean, so moving along the the route of uh, infrastructure, I mean, we today we've talked a lot about equity and mobility, and I know that you have shared a lot around um, the challenges of a third of our, our infrastructure actually being dedicated to cars. Um, again, and, and at the same time, you know, we're also cognizant of the fact that. Um, there are efforts out there and there's a lot of money being put into things like autonomous vehicles. And so one of the things that we grapple with is what is the role, what's the voice, what's the role of community in these efforts? And, and I'll tell you, there's a tension between legitimizing something and actually saying, this is sort of already happening. At least let's try to get into it. Get, let's mm -hmm. get into the conversation and have communities have a voice. Talk a little bit more about mobility. Um, I, you know, maybe share some of the thoughts that I know you've you've shared in other spaces um, around where you see the future of of mobility going. And and are there any reflections in the last eighteen months? I know at the beginning everyone was worried about we're all now going to be in single um, occup occupancy vehicles because we're afraid of this pandemic. How are you seeing how are you seeing the trends really shift? in preferences and and where do you see the future of, of mobility and and how it impacts obviously the equity of, of cities yeah it's a loaded huge, question lots, yeah. lots huge, of huge, huge and great question i mean first of all i'm very very skeptical of technological panaceas whether it's autonomous vehicles or ride share or electric vehicles or whatever you know and part of that is just all you have to do is be a student of urban history to understand what happened. I mean, you know, cities were built a certain way for human beings up until the end of the 1800s. And then, you know, structural steel, the elevator, and especially the internal combustion engine come along. And all of a sudden, we screw up the world in a way that we never could have even imagined that we were capable of doing because we so bought into this one technology hook, line, and sinker. We rescaled our cities and our streets and then the way we did things like housing and like cut out the informal sector and 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 cars are much to blame for this i mean there's a huge and then there's a by the time you get to the 1950s in this country then then there's an enormous racial component where the federal highway act is passed you know white flight red redlining which are things that happened before world war ii but you know like just there's this way in which the car instrumentalized segregation in the country and now is increasingly doing that around the world and so when people talk about their new hotshot technology about cars that can drive themselves which by the way i still think is a lot of hype um you know i'm i'm very skeptical at the same time i'm not a luddite i think technology can be great but, and I think, so I'm in the same bind you are, which is, okay, this, this thing is happening. How does one adapt themselves to kind of think about this thing in a way that's more positive? So like one example I like to give is during the pandemic, one of the things I noticed is 
the makeup of who attended community board meetings really changed. And suddenly mm -hmm. we started to see a much broader, I think, coalition of people, people who wouldn't normally be the usual suspects that came to public hearings and so forth, come to all sorts of meetings. And that to me was a really great kind of thing that came out of the pandemic and I hope stays. And so there are great things that can come out of tech, but I just, my big problem with the technology industry, and I gave a whole TED talk around this, is that technologists tend to like invent the thing they want to invent and then foist it and hype it on the world rather than say, what are the things that human beings really need technology to do? So for instance, wheelchair, critically important piece of technology, horribly designed, right? And we literally spend billions of dollars, Lord knows how much in carbon emissions, trying to accommodate this really poor piece of design rather than spend that on existing technology, which is to give every single person who needs a wheelchair a wheelchair that can climb stairs, which exists. And so that's just a small example of where I, there's this kind of mismatch in our economy between someone you know who invents a juicer that can talk versus like things that we really need. Um, you know, and, and that I think is, is where we need to have a broader conversation with the tech sector. Yeah, no, yesterday, um, one of our speakers, Anika Makwakwa, talked about, it, um, she talks about technology solutionism, right? We kind of feel like technology is going to solve everything. And it, a lot of it, as you're describing, is just in a lot of the investment, unfortunately, seems to be in search of problems and not necessarily actually solving the ones that are there, um, which is why we tend to really promote this idea of engagement, right? That the, the, trying to at least bridge this gap between technologists, government, and community as a way to create better matches, if you will, between the technology and the real issues that people are facing. Um, and so I guess one thing I'm curious about is in cities, uh, you know, planners have a great a great amount of responsibility and, and in some ways a lot of opportunity to try and also bridge these gaps, bring in appropriate technologies, think about some of the land use and mobility challenges of people in the design of cities. Um, I'm curious about your thoughts to the to the to the field, if you will. Um, what are I mean, what are some of the opportunities that you think planners themselves can take to be more um, creative or innovative, both with technology and, and at the same time, really obviously focused on the thing that they do, which is trying to build more livable cities? Well, again, I think we just starting with the big problems that we have. We have a housing crisis related to an equity crisis and a racial crisis. And housing, the cost of housing in the United States is absurd, particularly in terms of the cost of building more affordable housing in our inner cities. You know, cities like San Francisco and New York spend hundreds of thousands of dollars per subsidized unit to build affordable housing. And there are so many technologies that planners and you know, ur ur urban politicians and think tanks should be thinking about you know, cross-laminated timber, different, different technologies that if they got to scale, they could be cheaper, they could be more sustainable. Um, there's all sorts of ways of building out of this basic building material wood to create much more urban density uh, that's affordable in our inner cities. And I think we are, we're really, you know, like during the pandemic, Housing, housing prices in, in most suburban areas skyrocketed. Suburban poverty has been on the rise for 20 years in this country. And so, you know, we really, again, I would just center on the problems that we have. And similarly with mobility, I mean, I just think there's so much we can do with say, just basic rubber tire bus technology where we close more streets to private vehicular traffic, run zero emission buses, much more in a network, less about a central business district, more about, you know, the kind of entire kind of lattice of the city because people are working in a very different way and probably will continue to be going into the future and not everyone's going into that central business district. But my point is with all this stuff, like we know how to build out of wood. We know how to build a bus. Like, yes, there's technology that can make that more efficient, cheaper, more sustainable. Um, but 
it, 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 it doesn't, you know, the problem is technologists love to work on step functions because step functions tend to be very profitable, right? But a lot of times what we need in our cities, especially if we're really working with communities, is not step functions, but that, that more steady curve from where we've been to where we're going. Yeah. No, and I think this is why the financing question of a lot of this is so important. It's in some ways, I think, the elephant in the room, because I think it's, it seems like there's a challenge of incentives and really trying to draw a lot of the innovation that's in our disposal towards the real issues that matter. Um, the incentives are really lopsided um, towards Wait, things that are profitable. You know, like, for example, we all talk about Uber, you know, it's just a glorified potentially, you know, like it's a, it, it, in some way the service is already in existence. There's a convenience with the technology, but if we could use that same level of investment or manpower and, and, and brain to, Solve some sure. of our other mobility issues, it'd be, you know. Sure. Like take minibuses, you know, like in India, you know, they run minibuses everywhere that are like 20, 25 people. They run some minibuses that are women only because women get harassed on buses and so forth. But the thing is, imagine an on demand minibus service. There was an electric minibus service that ran on, ran in cities like Detroit and Newark that have large expanses of territory and where not everyone's going point to point to a central business district. That's using some of the same similar app technology, but something that is just fundamentally more socially broad. Yeah, there's definitely a coordination issue too here, right? I mean, like a lot of this, as you're describing, is technology and solutions. In some ways, we know we can iterate and innovate on them, but in some ways, we have, there's a lack of coordination to kind of bring these things to life. There's a there's a question um, from Herman Milligan about your recommendations for the development of infrastructure of opportunity um, that are maybe short term versus long term for urban areas. Mm. Well, I mean, in the short term, look, obviously, we're coming out of this pandemic in very unequal ways and communities suffered from it very unequally. And I think, you know, I think one of the more interesting things, I don't think cities are dying at all. You don't like when you look at the data, that just isn't what's happening. But, um, you know, obviously retail is in big trouble. There's a big mobility question around everyone trying to drive into the city. Um, mm -hmm. I would like, you know, I would try to ban as much private vehicular traffic from the central, most congested parts of our cities. I'm not talking about all of the city, but like, you know, in New York City, like Manhattan, why do we have private cars going to Manhattan? It's crazy, right? And like every city has some cordon of area and then rethink that area. Rethink what that can be because cities, if, if a lot of suburbanites say, you know what, I wanna work remotely and I'm not gonna go to the city so often and their employers agree to that. Well, what do cities become in the aftermath of that? Cities become places that are for the people who really love them. And I think we've been ignoring that population for way too long, including the communities of color that were really the bulwarks that kept our cities together through the 70s and the 80s, and really paying attention to the local needs of those people. And so by looking, re-looking at how are those streets used, how can we um, rethink ground floor retail, maybe as places of social infrastructure. I think as leases collapse, right? How can those places be healthcare clinics, vocational? I mean, vocational training is a disaster in this country, right? Like, you know, vocational training, senior centers. So I just think there's all, like, if there is a new emptiness having to do with the city, that's an opportunity right, to say, you know, what can we use that emptiness for that forms social infrastructure? Over the longer term, we have to pass that infrastructure of opportunity bill. We need federal money and we need to redirect stupid expenditures like the mortgage interest deduction, which is largely for rich people, into building housing for people who need it in our cities. So that to me is the way to think about things short term versus long term. Thank you. That's a, that's, that's a, this, I think the moment is, it's a really interesting moment to think about these outsized investments. And yet at the same time, the sort of kind of the tension of like, they're still hitting the mark. And we talked a lot about that yesterday with broadband um, too, you know, it's like never before have you seen this amount of money being spent. And yet at the same time, is it, you know, is it the level that it needs to be to really um, connect America, uh, American communities? Um, 
I'd love to kind of think about, you know, some successes and leave sort of on a, on a positive end here, which is, I mean, I think as you think about like, what keeps you optimistic um, about a lot of the kind of a a lot of what we're seeing in cities in terms of the trends, um, what, what, what gives you um, a hope that, that maybe we'll get it right, or hopefully we'll get it right. Um, And also, I mean, where, we talk a lot about, you know, um, you mentioned the idea of building 20th century cities using 21st century technology. Like, where do you also see technology having some really strong opportunities that we're just still not leveraging? So, I mean, where my optimism comes and the fact that, you know, most of our, like I said, when you look at the data, despite all of the anecdotal newspaper stories and stuff, I think the people who really love cities have stuck by them. You know, when you look at the sort of outdoor restaurant stuff and all of that, like it's not perfect, but it really shows this extraordinary, if you see, because people get it all wrong, I think, when they think that people only come to cities out of economic need human beings are a social species and yeah. like we've been building cities for millennia built around being together and being social. And so where I'm optimistic is this notion that people are still doing that despite the pandemic. And I think mass transit will recover and all of those things that like are big questions. You know, there are questions after 9-11. I was in New York government after 9-11 and like a lot of the same, you know, uh, progr- prognostications were going on. And again, I, I just, on technology, I just, just that that constant drumbeat of human need. I mean, when I, you know, when I work in the cities we were talking about, like I, I go through downtown Cleveland or downtown Indianapolis and understand what some of these communities went through from the 1950s through the 1970s and 1980s. It's extraordinary that they're still there and that they've stuck by. And like the technology needs, I think, are really about them and their needs. How can they be better integrated in their communities? There's kids, schools, all of those things before we invent highfalutin stuff for rich people who don't need it anyway. Yeah. No, um, I, I think this love of cities and the joy um, piece is, a, is such an com- interesting component. I was watching online. Um, just this past week, the Cleveland, uh, formerly Indians, now Cleveland Guardians, um, announced the change of the mascot. And what was most fascinating to me is I saw from several different people um, that they were alluding to the infrastructure. They were alluding to these um, to these figures that uh, now they are overseeing traffic. So they're the guardians of traffic known in Cleveland for mm-hmm. that. Um, so maybe not not the right analogy given the conversation we're having, but it was amazing to me that people uh, from Cleveland and in the community really yeah. noted that, that, you know, like the importance of those figures. And so I think to your point, people love, we love our cities and, and yeah. we love these these buildings and that infrastructure that's there that reminds you that that's the, that's the, you know, the, um, what is it? That's the backdrop of LA or of mm-hmm. Cleveland or of New York. Um, okay, a couple more questions here. Um, uh, so this concept of upcycling, um, uh, it seems like a key barrier is repurposing of the repurposing of the space is really political and existing residents and other people with political power push back um, against these ideas. How do we, I mean, how do you see us creating more political space to try to design these solutions? I mean, I do see a lot of hope in our younger people. You know, what's interesting is When I started writing about this stuff 10 years ago and was writing about, um, you know, kind of cities and suburbs and where, you know, when cities get money from the government, it is a subsidy. When new highways get built in the suburbs or you talk about the mortgage interest deduction, it's an entitlement. Um, And so there's this incredibly, not very subtly racial kind of divide between how we talk about government investment. And um, and what I discovered after my book came out was that like as I, I thought I would get a lot of pushback, uh, you know, in terms of red blue territories politically. That's not where the pushback was at all. The pushback was generational. And so what you find is the generation that benefited from a certain set of policies hangs on to them fiercely, whether they live in red states or blue states. And the generations that see themselves getting screwed, frankly, right, 
um, are ready to question all of that. Um, and so like, so we have a generation of renters right now and they're like, how come there isn't more government money in rental assistance as opposed to, you know, spending billions of dollars giving people with million dollar homes tax credits? Um, on the upcycling, it's the same thing. If you start taking roadway away from people who think it's their God-given right to drive, you know, a three-ton SUV to take their kids to school, and they, they think that road is theirs, whether they vote Democrat or, or Republican, they fight that tooth and nail, the notion, it is an entitlement for them to drive that SUV down that road as a taxpayer. That's the way they think about it. And they don't think about the 30 taxpayers that live on that road, or maybe the 300 taxpayers that live on that road, that maybe want to use that road differently and want to think about how to upcycle it differently, and that it shouldn't just be for you and your kids in this huge truck. And that's, I think we really have to engage young people in those discussions, but engage them in such a way that they have a reinstated view of what government is, because you can't just do this stuff as DIY. It is, you know, they have to believe in a political engagement. Yeah, no, that's a, I mean, it's such a key issue with young people because as much as there is a lot of angst and I, and, and, and deservedly so fear about their own future, that willingness to engage with the political structure to actually make, I mean, that's the challenge, right? There's almost like an apathy away from it. And yet, I don't, I personally am not sure it will be resolved if you don't actually engage in the, you know, in the political fight. Um, we have a question here about um, the psychology of affordable housing. Um, and I think, you know, a little bit on a related note, uh, as you just talked, you know, the Americans seem to really have a very different perspective or a negative connotation, whether city or suburban dweller on this idea of affordable housing. Um, so, for non-urban communities, do you see a potential shift with an equity gaps increasing? And also, I think there's a power, part of what you're saying is I think it's a, it's a power, it's like framing and storytelling. I mean, I don't know if you've seen really great examples of how do we really start talking differently about these issues so that we're not subsidizing versus entitlement, but really talking about the quality of life of the people in so, the city. So a couple of thoughts on this great question. Uh, first of all, uh, it's astonishing to me how many people think that the American dream has to do with houses and cars. So the, the person who termed the American dream in the 1930s, James Truslow Adams, talked about it as a dream of equal opportunity for all, regardless of race, gender, or social status, which was kind of extraordinary for the 30s. And th this notion of equal opportunity is deeply embedded in the country's cultural narrative. But somehow after World War II, we translated that into a much more commercial idea, which is that you sh if your, your, your definition of success is to own a lot of stuff, right? Cars, houses, et cetera. And so housing fell right in the kind of crosshairs of that transition. And so, you know, I kind of really like the way the questioner phrased the question because it's not about affordable housing per se. It's a question of like, why is urban housing unaffordable and suburban housing affordable? Why are urban school systems not as great as suburban school systems? There's a whole economic system that undergirds why those discrepancies are true. So in a sense, it's it's not about affordable housing as much as leveling the playing field because we've subsidized the suburbs so much that both urban areas and rural areas, both of which, by the way, have much lower carbon footprints per person than the suburban area in between, we've mm -hmm. subsidized that suburban area in between so much that now we have to talk about agricultural subsidies to the rural or urban housing subsidies for the cities because we just take for granted all the money we pour into the middle. Yeah. Um, no, I. Um... I think, I mean, I've heard you talk about the the subsidy question around housing, and I think the that it's a, I mean, I think for a lot of us um, here as part of the night uh, network, when we've talked about, um, we talk about equitable community development and look at this issue of affordable housing and also how do you ensure as we're thinking about building more vibrant public spaces and vibrant um, housing opportunities, you know, we're also grappling with the challenge 
not just of the of the subsidy question, but also of as you're investing in these areas, how do you think about the questions of gentrification and also the child continuing to, in some ways, do what you're, uh, in some ways, I think a lot of my colleagues are trying to do what you're espousing, but also being really conscious of the fact that it just keeps perpetuating this idea, uh, this notion, this, and I think it, it goes back to this notion of American, the American dream and owning a house and owning more cars. So even if we think about equity, it seems like, you know, there's still a tension between almost redoing what, um, and, and continuing to subsidize the sort of unsustainable vision of America that that we are in many ways still grappling with in cities. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why there's, you know, it's a two-pronged, at least a two-pronged effort yeah. on issues like policy and instrumentality and implementation when we're all out there, you know, we have a we have a project in East New York, one of the poorest parts of New York City that's 100% affordable housing. And like, we all need to work on those things at the day-to-day -day level. But at the same time, we also have to think about cultural narrative. What's the meta narrative that's driving us to call something subsidized, something's affordable? Why, you, you know, that, that like as long as people have in their head that rather than live in an apartment where I can take a subway or a bus or walk to work, I would rather live in that big house and 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 drive. Yeah. As long as that is the privilege status, you're always going to deal with this this kind of. Um, this, this kind of bias against what we're trying to do on the field, yeah. right? And and so it's a tough one. And cultural narrative is a really tough one, which is why a lot of us focus on books and teaching as well as, you know, yes. doing. And public engagement and, and civic engagement, um, right. as, as we do here. Um, well, listen, I want to be conscious of the time. I want to thank you so much for joining us. Um, and thank everyone, actually, for staying with us here on this Friday afternoon. Um, it's been so great to, I think a lot of what Vishan has said really also has touched on a, a lot of the different points made yesterday, whether it would be about how do we really think about visualizing a lot of the inequity in the communities and really understanding what that looks like in terms of tree canopies and green space um, and accessibility, um, or whether we think about um, you know, broadband and digital inclusion and how that has also, um, the inequities there and how that enters into um, the public realm as well. And then if it's available, if all of this technology is available, what do you really do with it? And, and do communities really have the skills to really bring that technology to life and also have and use it as a stepping stone, a stepping stone for opportunity. Um, Vishan, thank you again for joining us. Um, I'd love to just uh, wrap up the, the session here by inviting everyone to please, um, you know, share a lot of the conversation that you had here today. A lot of the audience are grantees. I hope you've met other grantees with um, innovative ideas, um, or I hope you've taken away um, some interesting points of view from the conversations over this two day, these two days. Um, you know, there's three themes that really have stuck out, and I think this conversation um, speaks to some of these um, in a lot of different ways. One, that having participatory communities is really the key. Um, and one of our speakers yesterday said, you know, nothing for us without us. The wisdom and the lived experience of residents is just as critical to policymaking and to designing technology as it is to ensuring that our communities are thriving and livable. Um, and also that all levels of government really have to be involved and working together. And that um, is no easy challenge. Um, we're facing civic and community transformation, and whether it be an infrastructure bill from the federal government or local zoning, I mean, and then the state, uh, uh, the opportunities that you need to be able to partner with states around, um, and state preemption is an example that came up. All three levels of government in the U.S. really have to be working together, and the capacity for cities to really um, work at those levels is going to be critical to ensure the kind of collaboration we need um, to innovate. And then lastly, um, you know, people need information, people need data to make, to make better decisions, both as citizens and residents of their community, as well as leaders, and to really understand some of the inequities, um, and also the possibility to understand what's actually really happening and resonating and relevant to community. Um, so those really have been, I think, three pieces of, um, of, of conversation that have like flown throughout our two days. Um, I've heard really amazing um, 
ideas um, myself, and I'm excited and energized um, by the conversations um, I've had on and offline about the forum. Uh, we invite you to uh, share your feedback um, and your critical feedback about this event. Um, you'll see a link to a survey chat. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much for joining us and happy Friday.